97.9 The Box is the man had a morning show in the studio with Kevin Powell. Ladies and gentlemen, Yay! journalist, <laughs> activist, and I know him from the real world. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what she said. Yeah. She that, that is really what she well, said. I know she you were on the very, very first season of Real World, right? Way back in the 1800s. You know oh, what I'm saying? No. It wasn't that long ago. 1992, way back. This True story. Look, man, uh, me and my father, not that we had a tumultuous relationship or anything like that, but, uh, you know, we had, had one of those awkward father-son relationships. And the thing that would always bring us together, I know this sounds crazy, we would watch back-to-back episodes of The Real World. Are you serious? We loved it. I don't know why that was our little thing. Hip-hop and The Real World first, second season. Wow. And we were watching back-to-back whenever I flew home. And he, we, I don't know what it was. We just shut up and watched Every every episode. Well, I'm glad y'all like, had that bonding thing. Yeah, I, I'm, me too, man. Probably you know, it's funny. That that's how I met Tupac. We were a Jack the Rapper. Remember the Jack the Rapper music yeah, conferences yeah, back yeah, in the day? Yeah. Atlanta, 93. Uh, Quincy Jones had just started Vibe Magazine with Time Warner. Mm-hmm. You know, Source was or, or, already existed. And um, I wanted to interview Tupac because of my activist background. I knew the Shakur name. That's famous. I knew who his mother was and everything. Right. And I said, you know, and Vibe was like, nah, that's cool. We never heard of him. You're going to do Snoop Dogg. So I did Snoop Dogg cover and I did uh, Tretch for Noy by Nature. Those were the first two covers of Vibe. Yeah. But I kept my Pac folder. So I met Jack the Rapper and his folks around him because this is right after Juice and everything. And he had, a, I think he was on his second album. And I was hesitant to go up to Tupac. One of my homegirls, Carla Rafford. Yeah, she she actually did it. She said, yo, Tupac, you need to know Kevin Powell. Pac turned around. He said, yo, I had your back on that MTV show. You my man. So I was a fan of his, and he was a fan of mine. I had your back against the white people. (laughs) (laughs) See, he didn't want to say that. But see, I read everything, Mr. Powell. I see. All right, man. All right. Activist number two in the studio. He he reads closely. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He does. He does. I'm trying to bring everybody together, brother. That's okay. That's okay. I mean, no. But that's what Pac said. That's actually what he said. You are one of my favorite journalists. Journalist because of thank Tupac you so. and yeah, thank you, so you know because starting at Real World I didn't know your career was gonna go the way well, it, it did. did. That's still surprising. You know, it kind of still. I thought you was gonna fall off. Really? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's just how people That's think. Honest. But you know what? But thank God and my mother who has an eighth grade education from South Carolina. I've been writing since I was a kid. So, you know, back then, it wasn't like the Kardashians or the Princess where you got on a reality show, you know, and you think this is your career. I was a writer. We all had careers. I was already mm-hmm. a writer. I was already, I was already grinding, man. Like, I wrote the first bio for Usher. I wrote the first bio for TLC. I was just... See, I didn't wow, know that see, now, I, did. yes. I, was, yes. I was grinding. I mean, because you know how the music industry is. You got to get in where you fit in, mm-hmm. and you grind in. And then, you know, Quincy and them came along with Vibe, and it was just an opportunity. And it actually happened in the same year. Vibe started in 92, MTV having set in 92, and so... It was it was life changing, man. Because you don't, you know. I mean, it, and it's all because of hip hop. Because hip hop has created opportunities for us. Mm-hmm. That's real. So That's right. I'm always thankful to our culture. That's how it happened. And I just kept going. And I said, you know what? I don't want to just write articles. And now I'm up to my 13th book. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Yeah. How'd you transition from real world to vibe and writing? No, I was always I was writing since I was 11 years old. I started writing professionally. I got my first check as a writer when I was 20 years old. How much what? was that? That check, check was twenty five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> that check was twenty five. Do you remember what that story was about? You know what's interesting? It was about a young brother named Michael Griffith who got killed in Howard Beach, just like mm. we talked about Trayvon, Sandra Bland. It was wow. a story about someone being killed before racial profiling case. Because yeah. I actually started off as a news reporter. I didn't want to be a music. I didn't even know about. I didn't even know what. There was no hip hop journalism. I didn't know you could do that. It was Harry Allen who was down with Chuck mm. D and Public yep. Enemy who mm-hmm. asked me, "Kev, do you write about music?" And I lied and said, "Yeah, I write about music." That's how I started. <laughs> <laughs> but I was a hip hop head. I grew up a graffiti writer. I used to be a b boy. I used to dance what was hard. Your tag what? Name? What was your tag name? K E P O one. Keep yep. one. That's still my nickname. You uh, really read must then. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Wow. You don't know you don't know people reading your stuff, man. You know what I'm saying? So I appreciate y'all. And I, I know who y'all are because I watch shows like y'all all around the country. Cause I you know, for me, one of the beautiful things about hip hop, I didn't get on a plane until I was 24. I, you know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. it was because of hip hop. I learned about Texas. I learned right. about California. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because we, we heard heard y'all references in these different areas. You pick up the language, the culture, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? You know, shout out DJ Screw, all the cats out here, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I know the history. You know, you know the history. I know the history. I mean H <laughs> has hold it, held it down so that's why I'm happy to be here you right. know what I mean why did you go on um, real world in the first place I don't remember that part of your story I don't, you know what honestly because I used to, I went to college with Sister Soldier and I knew what I remember was every time she went on TV she got speaking gigs I said well maybe I'll get a little check out of this maybe someone will invite me to speak somewhere that's all it was and it was something to do I really I mean, I was young, and I needed... You distanced yourself, too. From what I can remember, you kind of distanced yourself on the show. It's like, the show was a great platform, and you used it for what it was, but on most episodes, it was like, Kevin was like... Yeah, I mean, at that, you know what it was? Because I had just spent four years in college where we were fighting racism. Two to four years we were in school, we had taken over buildings, and I was not really feeling like... 
ignorance. You know what I mean? I'm keeping it real with you. That's what I felt at the time. Like, you know what? Some of this stuff I'm not really down with. And then MTV had its own history because, as y'all know, they didn't play Michael Jackson's videos in the right. beginning. Right. You know, um, I'm cool. you know you mentioned Ed Lover, Dr. Dre before we went on the air. You know they would always move your, your MTV raps. It was the number one hip, the, the hip hop show was the mm-hmm. number one show yeah. on MTV. And mm-hmm. They kept moving it around. So right. I always felt like they didn't treat black people properly. And I was like, mm-hmm. what I remember saying to myself, I'm not gonna be some sambo, some coon, some jigaboo on this show. You know what I mean? I'm not yeah. gonna play myself like that. I didn't know I was gonna argue with people, but you know it <laughs> happens. <Right. laughs> you know what I mean? But we're all cool now, all these years later. I mean because there's no way you can separate yourself from an experience like that. It's a unique experience, and little did we know that that would lead to this dude being in the White House with this ridiculous kind of reality show we're all living in now mm. called the Trump era, which is insanity, you know what I mean? True. So. How do you, how, do you know why you're going through this process or is your plan to end up doing all the things that you did? Because like Ooh. like he said, you think somebody going to fall off or after this, where does this guy go? No, I knew I was I was very clear I was a writer. You right. know what I mean? I didn't I didn't But see I didn't know that about you. So I, it was, I was like, man, he's smarter than I thought he was. Uh, uh you know yeah, I, I like your honesty, brother. <laughs> <laughs> you keep it you real. Know, and then once I was found out that you did all this, then I really became a fan. Well, I appreciate you know? it. I'm a fan and of y'all. I understand I'm a fan more of, y'all's. of the mission and what you were trying you to get do. Across, yeah. You know? Yeah. But my life, my since I was You're eighteen, I, I'm an activist. I'm a writer. I was real clear. I'm like my life is of service, and writing is a tool for that. Your know, speaking is a tool for that. And you know, um, and I mean, pop culture, hip hop. I mean, we got to get in where we fit in, and we know the impact. I mean, think about how many people listen to your show. You know, what I mean, and the impact that y'all have, and how do we use the platform? And so I always thought about that. Like, you know, it's cool if people know who you are, but what are you gonna do with this platform that you mm. got? You know, what I'm saying. So, yeah. what made you want to just be a writer at a young age? Did you say, hey? Because you knew early, yeah. and my brother knew early. He wanted to be a His writer. His brother's an incredible writer. But well, I don't. I didn't even know what I wanted to brother do. Brother lives in still, Austin. Yeah. Uh, John lives in uh, Austin, right? Yeah, he's oh, okay, in yeah. Austin. Well, you know yeah. what? It but was, he listens. <laughs> it was sports. It was sports. The first books I read. When I meet young heads now, and they say I don't like to read. I'm like, read stuff that you like. If it's fashion, is it? If it's automobiles, for me, if it's sports. Eight, nine years old, I'm reading about football. I'm reading about baseball, basketball. To this day, I'm a diehard sports fan. Mm-hmm. And I wish your Astros would have beat the Red Sox. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that the Red. Sox are it's in not the world just series, you, my friend. Yo. It's not just you. But the sports books felt made me fall in love with reading. And mm-hmm. at a certain point, I, dar- I started discovering writers. And it wasn't until years later that I realized that there are black, Asian, Native American, Latinx writers, women writers. Mm-hmm. I didn't know, but I just read Shakespeare. I, as a kid, I'm reading Shakespeare. I'm reading Edgar Allan Poe. I'm reading Ernest Hemingway. And I just fell in love, especially when you grew up poor, single mother. My mom's, like I said, an acre education. I grew up on welfare, food stamps, the kind of poverty I wouldn't wish on anybody. But it was books that helped my imagination. Like, mm-hmm. okay, there's another world out there, you know what I'm saying? And that's what did it for me, you know what I mean? So I try to stress to my oldest, she hates to read, that reading is so important. How old is she? She's 21. She can read, it's never too late. <laughs> she, <laughs> no, she, she can, but she just gotta find stuff her, that she likes. Yeah, you know the stuff I mean? she likes is morbid though, but I always tell her, just read, yeah. let's start reading so we can understand and know things. My little, yeah. my littlest one, she's good, but the oldest, ee, little touch on I it. mean, I got a whole campaign called Hashtag Read, Study, Travel that we're gonna push it through in 2020, and it's gonna be tied to my Tupac book when it comes out in 2020. Mm-hmm. Because, I'm gonna get back to Because Tupac too. read a lot, and that's important to say, you know what I mean? What about now? I'm gonna talk to you about your because I know I can you take got my a new, new York book. jacket off. It's hot in here. Okay. <laughs> I know you got uh, a book out now, but talk. Why the Tupac book? Why now? You know what? It's a After this book, I'm gonna tell y'all straight up. Um, I have actually not been to Vegas since September 13th, '96, when Pac died. Wow. What? what? I mean, really? And I'm going back soon because I mean it was traumatizing. Pac is killed, and then six months later, Biggie gets killed. I mean, Biggie's funeral was literally. I live in Brooklyn. I've lived in Brooklyn a long time, and it's like literally his funeral was down the street. A lot of us were traumatized by the whole thing. But through the years, so many people have asked me like, "Kev, when are you gonna do this Tupac book? When are you gonna do this Tupac book?" And I, you know, I, I've done a few things like when his mother asked me to support Resurrection, the MTV film that they mm-hmm. did about Pac. I supported that. But, you know, I mean, it was a lot to deal with, man, because y'all remember it was it was so-called East Coast, West Coast. Yeah. You know, you saw people, you know, fighting each other who looked like us, which, you know, as an activist, that hurt my heart because I know that was classic divide and conquer. Mm-hmm. But everywhere I've been, you know, I've been in Ireland. I've been over in Africa. People are asking me about Pac. I'm like, he went from the brother that I knew to this global icon, probably the most famous hip hop head we've ever had in, in our history. Yes. And, you know, I realized, you know what, when I first met Tupac, one of the things he said to me in the first interview, he said, Kev, I want you to be Alex Haley to my Malcolm mm-hmm. X. Like he knew mm-hmm. he wasn't gonna live a long time. But in my head, I was like, well, son, what if I wanna be Malcolm X too? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but I understood what Pac was saying, which right. was like, yo, you know, I don't know how long I'm gonna live, so I want you to have the story. You can feel that vibe from him? I could feel then? it. I mean, cause you know, it's energy from us. You know what I'm saying? We feel certain things. And if you listen to his music, he talked about death a lot. He talked about it a lot, you know what I mean? And it's like, you know, 
I said in the first article I wrote on Tupac, you may remember this, I said he was like the James Dean yep. of yeah. the hip-hop generation. James yeah. Dean lived at 24, Pac 25. Yeah. You know, and I almost, I, sometimes I regretted that. I felt guilty about saying stuff like mm. that. But, you know, when you, doing this, po I've interviewed over 100 people for this Tupac book over the last couple of years. I'm still interviewing people. I was just with his sister out in the Bay Area. And, and How's she doing now? She's doing all right. You know, you know mom Past a couple passed away yeah. and everything that's going on. It's been a lot, man, because it's like, I mean, this is a political family. You know, his mother was a Black Panther. You come out of the Civil Rights Movement. They, you know, he was, I mean, look at their name. Look at the Tupac, Amar Shakur. Mm -hmm. These are powerful names that our people gave their kids coming out of the Civil Rights Movement. So there's a lot of pressure there. But I think that um, I'm doing this book because, I, you know, there's multiple generations of people who plug into Tupac. I mean, you know, there's quotes from Tupac talking about Donald Trump in the 1990s. He was prophetic. It's like he almost saw stuff happening before it happened. If you put on a lot of his records now, they're still relevant today. You right. know what I mean? Yep. Very much so. So that's how what I'm doing. It, how long will it be before you actually put that out? I know, again, I know you're working. Sometime in 2020, I want to drop it right in the middle of the presidential election year if, on purpose. You know what I mean? What I was going to say is that, you know, we're going to be doing a tour around the country, probably 50 to 75 cities. And, you know, we're going to have the Tupac book. I'm also working on another book that will probably come out that year as well. I'm trying to be like Kanye and drop two books in the same year. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like when he's dropping two albums in a two month, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, we want to also inspire people. Like, yo, we got some work to do because, you know, the midterm elections, please vote out there, y'all. We got to vote. We yes, got to vote. Yes, Texas is a very, very important state, which is why I'm here today in Houston and Dallas in a couple of days. But also 2020, like, let's not complain about stuff. Let's make sure that we're out there organizing and participating in the process. And especially, you know, younger people. I mean, and not, and I don't want to put that pressure on young people. It's all of us. It's yes. all of us together. But, you know, the energy we need, you know, oftentimes comes from younger folks. You know what I'm saying? And, and we just need folks to be aware of what's going on. It's not enough to say you woke if you don't read and study and travel. We got to know what's going on. You know yes. what I mean? All right, I'm going to get back to your book. Talk about what you're doing here today in H-Town. Oh, Let's yeah. talk about that a little bit. Because I'm, 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 they, they, I know they said that you were like on a 12-city run yeah. and doing your thing at the Houston Museum of African American Culture. So you got that going. And it's free. What you got going on today? Doors are open at 6. 30 yeah. at the museum. 4807 Carolina is where you're going to be, y'all. Uh, museum of African American oh. Culture. So We're going to be talking there. about my, my, my new book, uh, which is a little bit of a provocative title, My Mother, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and the Last Stand of the Angry White Man. You know what I'm saying? I dreamed the title. It's a little bit of a provocative title? A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> okay. Some, some folks but are... That's what little is. <laughs> You know what? I dreamed that title. My mom has been sick for the last couple of years. I'm only child. I've been taking care mm -hmm. of her. You know what I mean? I know but how I'm, hard that is. And I've been thinking about, you know what I'm saying? And I've been thinking about Barack Obama. This is 10 years since Barack got elected. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And like all the stuff that happened, all the stuff did not happen. And then obviously Donald Trump and the anger that he has unleashed. I mean, I was in Charlottesville a couple of weeks ago. And, and, you know, the stuff, I mean, just yesterday in news, you know, how the Bill and Hillary Clinton, the Obamas, other folks got mailed, you know, pipe bombs. Bomb. You know what I'm saying? Crazy. And so when I say the last senator, angry white man, this is not all white people because I love all people, I don't care what your background is, but there's something wrong when we have leadership in this country that is pitting people against each other, you know, who are anti-immigrant when this country was built on the backs of immigrants, that's anti-women, you know, we have a you know, se sexual predator who's been put on the Supreme Court, you know, we need to think about this stuff, Me Too movement is happening, you know, I very much support that as a man, you know what I mean, and so for me, the book is really about, like, let's examine where this country is and where we need to go, you know mm. what I'm saying? Uh, the book is available now as well. Yeah, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. I'll get that book. So, talk about the part. I'll make sure we mail books to y'all. Please, yeah, don't, please. Y'all, not everybody else out there. <laughs> <laughs> y'all in here, you know what I'm saying? How deep, how deep are you going to go with the part about your mother? Because a lot of people don't know yours. Can you tell just a little bit of your background? I know we've like all over the place. Nah, a little I mean, bit it, about who Kevin Powell actually is. Because wow. I know a lot of the MTV and on, but a lot of people don't know, you know. I'm just a brother in America, man. I mean, I, I feel lucky to lot, be alive. Man, because as you know, I mean, a lot of our, our brothers don't survive the inner city environment. It's either early deaths, you know, many of us who came through the crack era, y'all know what I'm talking about, or we're in jail, you know what I mean? Or we in and out of jail. I got friends who, like, it's like their second home, basically, you know? And so if it wasn't for my moms, you know, my father I saw two or three times up until I was alive, I wish... I could have had my dad watching TV with me. I wish I could have had those kind of experiences, you know what I mean? And I just say the father's out there, and I'm not a biological father yet. I just got married a year ago. But, you know, if you're a father figure, the most important thing we can do for our kids is just show up, man. Just show up and let them know that you exist, that you care. And I didn't have that. And so, you know, I was an A student growing up, but I also fought a lot. I got arrested by times as a teenager a few times. And I remember mm -hmm. the judge said to my mother, if I see him again, we send him away. And she never saw me again, you know what I mean? And I went to college because of financial aid package, Rutgers University, New Jersey. I didn't even know that 
the black college that existed until I got to college, you know what I mean? Because I just didn't know, because I didn't really know anything about my history. And I said to all people, no matter who you are, you got to know who you are. If you're Latino, Latinx, if you're if you're Asian, if you're Native American, even if you say you're just white, well, are you Italian, are you Jewish, are you Polish? Because that gives you the foundation. And growing up, I was very self-hating and self-loathing. My self-esteem was shot. And it wasn't until I got to college and I started learning about myself now that I realized. Your self-esteem was shot. Yeah. But how does one person get so much ambition? I mean, you said your mama went to the eighth grade, yeah, right? Yeah, my mama. So who were some of the people or who were influencing you that, hey, you know what? You can go a little bit farther than high school. Yeah, because you said that you got self-hate. I, I can't see how you can have self-hate and still be motivated and, and, and make it. You yeah. know what I mean? Well, you know what? I, I, my mama, shout out to single mothers. Shout out to single mothers. My mother said to this from the time I was three or four years old, you're going to college, you're going to college, you're going okay. to college. That planted the seed. Mm-hmm. It was my mother who took me to the library when I was eight years old. You know what I'm saying? It's my mother who said, you got to have good grades. My mother couldn't even help me with my schoolwork after I was in the fifth or sixth grade, but I, it was in me that I got to keep going. Mm-hmm. When I got to high school, it was me that said, okay, here, mom, here's the application just signed by the ex. And so she planted those seeds. Y'all know when you come from the dirty South where my mother did South Carolina and you grew, you hear these stories of people picking cotton and the racism she had to deal with and the sexism as a woman and the classism as a poor person, that has an impact on you. You know what I mean? And you don't want to, I just... I didn't want to be poor for the rest of my life. I knew that we deserved something better. I didn't know what it was, but I was like, there's got to be something better for me out there. And then once I got to college, my, my imagination, like I said, it just exploded, man. I was like, oh, there's a whole world here. And when I got on a plane for the first time, man, I remember I was scared. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> man, I'm, I'm 24 years, half my life ago, 24 years, years old, and I've now been to all 50 states and five to seven continents. Wow. And that's, that's because... You know, my mom planted that seed, like, keep learning, keep doing no matter what. And I, I, I didn't have no support system. A lot of us don't have no support system. Right, there right. was no mentor. There was no coach. There was nothing. I played sports. But it was it's my mom's. And I, I just, I got to say that again. Shout out to mothers out there. Especially. Dog determination. Yeah, yeah. So she's the reason you turned your life around, like, after you were arrested and all that stuff? Well, she was also there... said to me, "You ain't gonna. I don't know if you're gonna make it, boy. That has an effect on you too." <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And you know what I mean? It's I, I struggle. I mean, like a lot of males, you struggle with what, what is a man. Mm-hmm. You know, which is one of one of the books I've done was called a few years ago called the Black Male Handbook. I'm working on another book for all men of all backgrounds. I see a lot of confusion about what manhood is. I thought it was violence. You know what I mean? I thought it was ego. I thought it was like you know us beefing with each other. And that's not that's not what it is, man. It's got to be the kind of love. Honestly, that I felt when I walked into this space, that's what it should be. Where you know, any expression of manhood, you know, is, is yeah. But we're not taught that. Kevin. No, Let's we're just not. Be honest. No. We, we, like you said, we're taught that you know, man fight, man, man hammer. Eat meat. You know, we're not. We're, <laughs> we don't. Yeah, for real. We yeah. don't. We don't right. get emotional with our kids. I mean, I, I come from a house that was not emotional, and I had to learn that because I got two girls, and they need hugs, bro. They yeah. need them, and they need them regularly and hourly. Let me tell you something. Son, you said. When I went to college, the, the first two weeks I met Sister Soldier. She was known as Lisa Williamson back then. She tried to hug me. I realized I had never been hugged properly before. Like, I recoiled. Like, I yep. didn't know how to hug. That's right. Let me bring it back to Tupac. The thing that I would say is, like, you know, people, there's a lot of things people can criticize Pac for because he was all over the place. His brother was a Gemini, so there was a lot going on. <laughs> but you can't deny that he expressed every emotion. You knew when he was, what he was feeling. And I say to men, look at that example. Even when he was charged with that sexual assault case, one of the things he said in that prison interview, right. he, he maintained to the end, I didn't do, do that it. to that young lady. But he said, what I'm guilty of is not stopping the other dudes from dis- disrespecting that young lady. Mm. That takes a different kind of man. He was only 22, 23 when he said that. Mm. That's what we need to get to. And that's what women are saying with me. Me Too, which was started by a black woman, Toronto Burr. Hey, y'all need to think about it because it's not okay to disrespect women, you know, in any form or fashion. And that's what I've evolved into because I feel the same way. Kevin, I have to ask this. Since you mentioned the Me Too, I see, we see that Bill Cosby is one of the few of the men that yeah. they made all these claims against to go to jail. Yeah. Why isn't it been other you, people? You know, you know, you know where I'm, where I'm going. Is it, is it overly apparent? That because one man is of color and the others are not, that we have not seen the magnitude, like they've thrown this brother in jail. Some of these other guys have done some some very dastardly things too. We have not heard about them going to jail. We have not heard about them going to court. We, I feel like their cases will all be dismissed and, and, and will go quietly away. Well, let me say this as a man in general, um, that it is not acceptable for any of us to disrespect, Absolutely. violate women in any form. Yes, I, I don't support that. I support women as our equals, as our equals, as our equals. Yes, but I will say, also, you're right. Racism is alive and well. 
Harvey Weinstein, Roman Polanski, Matt Lauer, Charlie Rose. Hmm. You know, we can go through a whole list. Most of the folks have been white males. Yes, sir. Hmm. And so you're asking, you do ask the question because of racism in this country, where is the prosecution of these gentlemen at? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so oftentimes what happens is that black men become the poster boys for the bad behavior as if the white men don't do the same thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it's not either or, but it's both because unfortunately I do know women who are survivors and have been accusers of Bill Cosby, just like I know women who, who accuse uh, Harvey Weinstein. They actually live in New York. I know them, you know what I mean? But you're right. I think that um, at times racism rears his ugly head. And so one person is put away and then you're wondering, like, well, what's, what's Weinstein going to What's going to happen to him? Because he has an equally long track record here, you know what I mean? And so, you know, but I just think that it, it comes a difficult thing because we don't want to um, – dismiss, you know, bad behavior no matter who does it. Yes, but you do need to say this is clearly a pattern of black men being blamed for stuff. Right. And they, we're penalizing a way that white men can get away with it because of white male privilege. Let's call it what it is. How long do you think we will be before we will see change? Like in even the jail system, you know, we see, you know, the wow. disproportionate number of blacks. I just <laughs> threw that out there, but I'm just curious because you're on the front line of a lot of the things that happen. I want to bring it back to a great question. Back to, and these are great questions. Organizing and voting. Like I live in Brooklyn, New York. Very quietly, we got the biggest black community in America, over a million black folks in Brooklyn, you know, three million people. We'd be the fourth wow. biggest city, but you go to the court system any day, Monday through Friday, black and Latino bodies. And judges who don't look like us, and it comes back to voting and organizing, most of us are getting sent to jail by people who don't even live in our communities. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And so we think about that. And so when you, I bet you people listen to this show got family members in H-Town who are in the prison, caught up in the prison industrial complex. But how many of us actually organize in our communities, actually vote on a regular basis? And then you wonder why we're just giving these stiff penalties, you know, say, well, you just, if you just take these five years, you just take these 10 years, we don't even know, a lot of us don't even know our basic rights. So it comes back to being educated, man. It's like, you don't know, they can do anything to you. It is really what Michelle Alexander said in the book, The New Jim Crow. Y'all should read that oh, book. Oh, yeah, I heard that's a good book. Modern Day it. Slavery. That's what it becomes. And then you can, one of my homeboys, I was just in the West Coast. He's from LBC, Long Beach. He said his cousin was shipped from Mississippi, from California, Mississippi to Arizona, now back to California. Where was, how was he shipped? Private prisons. Yeah. You know what I mean? So they, they, you, you're being treated as free For labor. For profit. Business. For profit. Right. Thank you, Brother Cooper. And so we need to understand that stuff. And think about all those states where if you got a record and you come out of jail, you serve your time, you still can't even vote. Yeah. Which is, that's not just, you know what I mean? And so think about all the black males and black women and Latino males, Latino females, because we make up the majority of the prison system who are stripped of their basic right to vote. And so as long as we're on the sidelines, not participating, this is why it never changes. But a lot of people feel like, and, and it's sad when you hear it, my vote don't count. It does count. It does how count. It does count. How can we convince people who don't think that they should vote, they can't vote, not register to vote? Because this is a mission that we've been on for years. I'm going to put it to you like this. Y'all, people are in shock about Donald Trump being the president. Well, guess what? Them folks that support Trump vote consistently. They're right. organized consistently in places like Texas, all around the country. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Whereas we, we only get excited if it's Beto O'Rourke or Barack Obama, some sort of personality. I'm like, you, you, it's got to become part our value system right. just like we on these droids the iphones on a regular basis tweeting all this stuff ig and everything like that like you gotta know what's going on man and it's like it does it does affect everything because when you don't vote it determines what go what resources come to your school to your community when you don't vote it determines what judges get there who send your cousin your brother your mom or somebody to jail yes, you know what i mean and so we got to think about it in a, in a whole fashion and i'm saying to y'all out there it's like there are people in place who and i've run for office there are people who don't want you to vote when i was congress. running for, i ran for congress in brooklyn yes yeah, twice Twice. Well, three times. You're right. You're right. Yeah, three times. And you know, what they, you know what the number one thing they said to me? People who were supposed to be consultants, they said, "Don't even worry about the, the don't worry about poor people." I, of course, I'm not worry about poor people. I come from poverty. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about young people. I was like, "Of course, I'm not worry about young people because I love young people." They actually said, "Don't worry about the people who don't vote." That's right. what was said to me by so-called consultants. Meanwhile, I'm talking to everybody. So I'm saying to y'all, there are people out there who really believe that they that that you know that we don't care, and then they can do anything they want with our communities, and that's not that should not be acceptable to Will us. Will you run again? I gotta ask my wife. <laughs> my wife's she like, saw, she's somewhere saying, "Good answer, baby. Good answer, baby." We'll talk about that's it when you lot. get home, boo. That's a lot. You All, know right. What I'm saying? All right. So the book is called. Give me the name of the new book one more again. My mother, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and the Last Stand of the Angry White Man. It's on sale everywhere, and I even did the audio book myself. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, cool, and cool, then cool. the Tupac book will be out in 2020, and I will definitely be coming back to H Town on a big tour because we're gonna tie the Tupac book into voting, everything we're talking about right now. You know, right, what I'm you gotta come back. Here. Yeah, it'll be my honor. Thank oh, you all. And again, today, uh, Houston Museum of African American Culture. It is absolutely free. 
It's absolutely free. All are welcome to come. Doors are open at 630. And again, that's on 4807 uh, Caroline. Cooper. Kevin, one more question. Yes, sir. Three books that everyone should read right Ooh, now. I like that. Excellent question. The first one I would say is A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. Um, um, Sisters of the Yam by Bell Hook. Sisters of the Yam by Bell Hook. Because I want people to understand why Me Too exists. And then number three, wow. Honestly, my favorite book ever, The Autobiography of Malcolm X. You know what I mean? No matter what your background, I think you, everyone should read that book because it's really about America. You know what I'm saying? And, and if I can just add this one thing, like I have hope in spite of everything. I had a brother hit me up on, on, on social media this morning. Like, why do you care, Kevin? Like, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have hope. And so I just want us to, no matter how bad things look right now, we got to have hope. And I mean, think about it. As hip hop heads, hip hop was created by the same poor people that Dr. King told us not to forget. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And look what we turned. We took something that was just two turntables, a microphone, some magic marker, spray paint. Billion dollar business. Multi-billion. <laughs> Dollar global right. industry. So if we could do that, anything is possible. That's, That's what right. I feel. You know what I'm saying? Thank you so I much. I got one more question oh, for you. Go. So has there ever been like a piece or anything that you wrote that you were hesitant to put out because maybe you thought it was too much or something and you went back and forth with yourself? Yeah, my my, my book before the um this one now is called The Education of Kevin Powell. It's an autobiography about my life and it's like I had to talk about my mom's. I had to talk about my family, some of the, a lot of dysfunction. I had to talk about being a child, you know, who grew up in violence and abuse. I mean, that was hard, you know what I mean? But I feel like you don't heal as a people, as a community if you're not honest about where you are. And so, you know, I felt, I, after I finished the book, I felt empowered. And I knew I couldn't do that book, The Education of Kevin Powell, and then tack, didn't tackle, I couldn't go to the Tupac book because I got to deal with all his dysfunctions and demons and stuff like that, as, as well as his genius, mm -hmm. without doing that book first, you know what I mean? So I just say to people, be honest about who you are, you know what I mean? Because uh, we got enough folks out there living lies, and one of them is called the President of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Real talk, you know if, what I'm saying? If Tupac was here, what would you where do you think his career would have went? You know, it's a great question. Um, I was blessed this year to do two cover stories for British GQ. One was on Michael B. Jordan, Black Panther, in Ooh. February. I just heard that reaction. <laughs> Michael's a dope brother, too. And the other one's just she now. She thinks he's fine. Is. That that she, is. she ain't thinking about what you're okay. saying, but she also I'm talking about him as an actor. Thank but, you. <laughs> and, then ch ch <laughs> <laughs> and then the new one is on, y'all can go online on, on British GQ doc, on the website, and the uh, new one's on Chadwick Boseman because they just voted him International Man of the Year. I actually said to myself, Tupac would have been Black Panther. You know what I mean? I think I actually think he was a greater actor than rapper. He never really reached his mm. potential. And when I keep talking, I have interviewed a lot of people who went to that high school with him in Baltimore that he and Jada Pinkett went to. Mm -hmm. Everyone kept talking about his greatness as an actor. And you saw it in Juice. You he know did. what I mean? Right. He did. You know what I mean? I just feel like he never reached his potential because y'all know he got in trouble a lot and he got kicked out from movie sets and stuff right. like that. And I just think that Pac would have been one of the greatest actors ever. And I he would have always been an activist. He'd always been speaking out. You know what I mean? Because that's in his in his blood. But I really think that his gift to us would have been who he was as a performer. You know what I'm saying? Saying. And, and so you were around the time he did that interview with Suge, right? And you went up there. That's always one of my favorite stories. Can you give him a little bit about it? That's the famous cover. Like, y'all remember, what was the movie um, with Joe Pesci and De Niro? Uh, Goodfellas. Goodfellas. Yeah, yeah. So we borrowed the cover from Goodfellas. It's the famous cover of Vibe Magazine where you got Suge, Snoop, Dre, and Tupac on the cover. The black. The black photo? Yeah, the yeah. black photo. Yeah. I love that. And the, the back story is the original the original colors was uh, blue, and someone called from death row and said, y'all, can y'all change the colors to the letters on the magazine in red? We're like, oh, right, we forgot. <laughs> <laughs> good, <laughs> good move. <laughs> good move. <laughs> good move. And, um, that could have played differently. <laughs> but the, the, the story was that um, I went to interview Shook. I got a call. like it, I was in L.A. waiting for Shook to do the interview with me, and I got called at 3 in the morning to come to his office. I was like, okay, 3 in the morning. It was freezing. Okay, we're scared. Yeah, well, I'd be like, I'm not going at three in the morning to Shug's time, office. Like, hey, man. You mean little stories like them hanging people from windows? Yeah, just, just, those those like that? just those small stories. <laughs> I mean, you know. You're scared. You're young. You, you're... I was... I was hood aware. I'm going to say that. I was hood aware. Ah, <laughs> I was hood aware. You know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> I come from the hood. And right. so I sat there and I interviewed him and he had his dog there chilling and he had the... You know how they... A you, big dog? The dog's name was Dama, which meant blood in Swahili. You yeah. know what I mean? And he had the logo, the death row logo. Y'all remember the famous logo with the uh -huh. dude? And I interviewed, asked him all these questions. Then I asked the last question that he didn't like. It was about his homie getting killed in um, Atlanta, I think it was. Oh, yeah. And mm. so when the interview was over, he asked, Shook said to me, you know, I didn't like them questions you was asking me. And right when he said that, the dog raised up. And I was like, okay. I'm <laughs> 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 not making You're a lie. The dog raised up. The dog up. raised no. up. And I think it's an article. I'm pretty sure it's an article. Because yeah. people said to me, Cab, we felt like I was there with you. Cab's like, I was eating popcorn. I was eating popcorn. <laughs> and he said to me, I didn't like them questions you was asking me about the dead. And I was like, okay. And um, what I remember was, that was it. 
And I said, can I see Pac? He said, he busy. You know what I mean? Because Pac was in the studio all the time, you know, at that time. And I walked out. And a couple years later, after Pac was dead, me and Suge, and people can look this up on YouTube, actually crossed paths again on BET. You know what I mean? It was me, him, Daniel Smith, who had been the editor-in-chief of Vibe Magazine, yeah. great music journalist, and Michael Eric Dyson, a scholar. And something Shook said, and I remember saying this, that we went to a commercial break. I said, man, ain't nobody scared of you. You know what Ooh. I mean? And it's on, it's on the show. I think I sort of remember this. This was on, this yeah. was on BT. But after that interview, was, after that show was over, Shook actually said to me, you know, we could go settle this in the bathroom. That's what he said. This was in New York, and I'm not gonna say what else happened in you know New York, folks, because I'm from New York, and thank y'all, New York, y'all got my back. That's all. Ah! I'm saying. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you never, never, never quite leave the ghetto. It's that's always right. in your back pocket. That's, that's what right, I would say. Right, but right. I just, I mean, it's just, I mean, that's part of the reason why it took me a long time to get to doing a Tupac because you you have to revisit all this stuff. Okay, since you're from New York, me and Hatter went to New York to see Tupac. Well, it was at the Source Awards. He came Ooh, out, he did this those... song called I Don't Bail or something. Yeah. Uh, or something. He dissed New York. I'm like, this fool is crazy. He from New York, too. He I know. It. That's what, that was crazy to me, to diss New York and you from New York. I was like, he's going to get killed. I thought he was going to get killed then. Wow. Mm. I mean, you know, and it's, 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 it's like, man, there's so much stuff. Like, I remember when after I interviewed Shook, that what I just described to y'all, mm -hmm. me and Pac talked on the phone. We were both in L.A., but for whatever reason, I couldn't see him in person at the time. So the last time I actually saw him, Alive when I think about it was, the, was in prison when I did the prison interview with him. But in that phone interview, I said, Pac, man, you know, why can't you and Biggie just sit down? Y'all was homies. And he said to me famously, green M&Ms and, and yellow M&Ms don't come together. And so it's hard to process. And that's what I'm grappling with this book, because here's this brother who talked about, you know, people coming together. But at the same time, he didn't want to sit down with Biggie. You know what I mean? And so it's like, you know, and I, I just you wish you wish that he could have turned that corner. You know, what I mean? are you getting different stories? Because some of those guys that even were hanging on saying that they felt that at some point in time, Pac would turn the corner and there would be some togetherness uh, with him and Biggie. You know what I'm saying? But it had to be on his time. I agree. I mean, we also got to keep in mind, Pac was only 25 when he died. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's like, you know, again, I love all young people, all generations. But when you're in your 20s, you're still trying to figure stuff out. I mean, I was trying to figure stuff out. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I, you just wonder what, if he could have made it to 30, if he could have made it to 35. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, you just don't know. And I, I don't. it's like when we ask, well, what would Dr. King be doing? What would Malcolm X be doing? We don't know. Yeah. You know what I mean? We could speculate. But, you know, it's one of the, it was one of the saddest periods in my life. And that's what made me avoid the book for a long time because mm -hmm. I knew I had to go back and I mean, I'm straight up with y'all. And this, it, the interviews I've done with Park, some people have cried during interviews. Sometimes I've cried. Sometimes we've cried together. Sometimes I had to get off the phone after the interviews were over. I'm talking about interviews that have been three, four, five hours. There are people who haven't never talked about Park publicly before. And it's like, you know, it's like, but we got to let, you know, it's it's hard, man. Like, right, working on this Tupac book, I now understand how people felt who are older when John Lennon of the Beatles got killed, when mm. Marvin Gaye got killed. It's like, or when Bob, Bob, Bob Marley died. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you because it's, is someone, I mean, when you think about it, let's put it like this. There's Michael Jackson, there's Prince, there's the Beatles, there's Madonna. You know, Pac is in that, Elvis Iconic. Presley is in that conversation of multi-generational, multicultural, global icons. Mm. There's not a lot of, I mean, in hip-hop, maybe Jay-Z, maybe Eminem, there's not a lot of folks you can say are multi-generational, multicultural. Drake. Drake, Drake, you know, a few people like that, you know, who had that kind of reach. And I'm going to tell you, man, I, I've been places where I remember being in, in the Bay Area. A young white brother was sitting in the, in the front of a high school auditorium. He had a Tupac shirt on. He, was, he wasn't even born when Pac was alive. I went up to him and said, well, who are you? He said, my dad's the CEO of eBay, and I, I love Tupac. And he knew everything about Pac. I'm in Ireland a few years back. Irish brother, <laughs> Irish brother said to me, I want to tell you something, Kevin. I said, what's up? He said, man, Pac's the biggest rapper in, in Ireland. I said, yo, Pac is dead. He said, it don't matter. I was mm. like, wow. What? Yeah. Mm. And so that's when you begin to realize that, you know, this is something bigger than what we could ever imagine. That's when I started saying, Kev, you got a responsibility to tell the whole story like Tupac actually. How, how truthful can you be in that story, though? Because everyday Pac, like you said, there's, a, there's the different facets of Pac. There's some bad, 
some bad things about him, and there's there's some great things about Pac. I gotta be honest about it all. I mean, you can't yeah. you can't uh, whether it's a film or a documentary or a, a biography like this. You have to. I mean, this is where my journalism comes in. You got to pull all this stuff together. I got a team of like 20 people working on this book. I ain't never had no team of no 20 people working <laughs> on no book. But it, it's like it's that complex. That I mean, think about Pac lived in New York, Baltimore, right. L.A., uh, uh, the Bay Area, Atlanta, and he died in Vegas. And it's like you got to get all those different stories. And y'all got a way to put it together. And y'all know as industry folks yourselves, you meet a a lot of people. So people are going to like, yo, I know you, I know you, I right. know you. But they're going to have their own different stories about it. And so you got to figure out, okay, what's the truth? What's right. not the truth? What goes in the book? What, not, what doesn't go in the book? What, so have you learned anything new that you didn't know? Since I have learned a lot. You think he going to say it? I can't tell say it. No, I'm just asking. I just, no, I don't expect him. I just wanted to know. Oh, I've learned. Okay, I've I'm, learned sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, oh, Mr. Cool. People, people, expect- people going to see some stuff in this book they could not have Because imagined. I've read every book about Pac in the world. Yeah, same here. And I've watched every documentary. And I've learned some stuff that that will be profound to people. What? Mm. I can't wait now. No, I no, can't. I, I, I can't. I, I, I can't wait. I'm, I'm, I can't. I'm willing to wait. I'm willing it, to but wait. But it's gonna be. It's gonna be. It's not gonna be what people expect. Like it's. Y'all got. Y'all got. Just read the book. It's gonna be. It's, it's. 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 I'm proud of what we're putting together. But it's like, wow, this stuff I didn't know, and I know a lot about pop. You yeah. Know what I mean, you know, but it's also stuff we're gonna learn about hip hop, right? Working on this book, you know, and I'm just, I'm really honored. But after I finish this Tupac book. I'm like, I want to go make films. I need a break from books because this is, cause Pac, Pac takes, it's a lot. I feel his spirit all around me as I'm working on this book. You know what I mean? How'd you feel about the movie? I have no comment. <laughs> well, well I, knew, I, knew that, I knew that was coming. Yeah. I was coming. I, 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 let me say this. You know, I'm coming from a position of love with Pac. I, this is not money. I mean, honestly, some of the interviews that I've had to do, I've had to use freaking flyer miles and hotel points and stuff like that. This is a labor of love for me because I see, I see how important he is to a lot of people, and I'm representing it like that. That's all I can really say. You know what I mean? I'm doing the best I can. Uh, as a as a as a documentarian to tell his story, which is really our story, you right. know what I mean? Because it's really it's really a story about hip hop, to be honest with y'all, you know what I mean? Kevin Powell, man, we appreciate you so much. Again, make sure you guys check him out tonight. Uh, tonight, October twenty fifth, Houston Museum of African American Culture. It is absolutely free. Doors open at six thirty. Museum located forty eight zero seven Caroline. Y'all go there, check out. Care. Make sure you take the book. Can they if they take bring the, I'll bring sign the book? The book you, yes, you will sign the book. Yeah, you know, and we're selling the books there too as well. I'm gonna need my autograph copy, my man. I'm gonna mail it to y'all. I got right, y'all, I'm and thank y'all for having. No, me. thank you, man. Thank appreciate you, man. y'all. Thank you so much, brother. So we're back here, 97.9 The Box, Kevin Powell in the building, Mac is awake and intrigued and not on social media. Wow. Come on, man. Kevin, I you got, on hey, look, media right now, while. his phone is turned face down. Come on, y'all. Wow. We ain't going to never see this again. <laughs> Mac, here's a question for Kevin. Go ahead, Mac. Go ahead. What's the Kevin question? Get in his business. This is what he does best. <laughs> no, I was just sitting here thinking. Uh-oh. And, you know, I was wondering. Yes, sir. Why haven't you ever got married? Or what now. took you so long to find that person? Mm. And did you ever think that you would find that person? And did the people in your family like, man, care? You bet. What happened? What's wrong? What, what you doing? What age were you when you got married to? Oh, I was old. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, let me put it like this. Like, you see how George Clooney got married and just had twins? Gotcha. I'm like, George Clooney old. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, no, you're not. Yeah. You know, no, I'm younger than George Clooney, but I, I, I honestly, yoga, met my wife in yoga, wasn't looking for it. I just, like, I never thought I'd get into, like, I'm a runner. We're talking about running. I right. run a couple marathons. I love running. And so in order to protect my body, I started taking yoga because running is, like, painful on the, on the oh, joints right, and stuff right. like that. You know what I mean? And one day, three years ago, I saw my wife in class, and we've been we were un- inseparable. What was it about her? Man, her spirit, man, her aura. You know, what I mean, just a beautiful sister, um, and smart, and you know, we shared a love. She's a dancer, choreographer. We share a love of the arts. You know, as, as fellow creative people. And I wasn't looking for it. That's the most important thing I would say. I wasn't looking for it. it just kind of happened. I honestly was looking. As a single man, I was actually looking into adopting a kid, man. Like, my man mm. Bill Harper just adopted a kid a couple years ago. Like, I was like, well, maybe I'm just going to adopt a kid. Because I really wanted, wanted a child. Yeah, I wanted a kid. I want, you know, but I've had so many, I had so many bad relationships. And sometimes I was the bad one. Sometimes okay, she was the bad one. Be, okay. right. Oh, no, I will, I'll take my ownership for my issues. And, and, then, and then, like, you know, I honestly believe because my mom and daddy wasn't together, that had an effect on me. You know mm. what I mean? Because I didn't really see a lot of healthy relationships around mm. me. And then a lot of my homies, one of my friends, he's on his third marriage, man. It's just like, and, and, and man, every one of them has been bad. And I was like, well, I don't want to do that. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so, and no judgment because things happen. You Let know? me ask you now, do you think it's because of the way he grew up, his family, his background as to why he's been not able to get it right, so to speak? No, nah, he just smoked too much weed, man. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to say 
he's getting ready to say something deep. <laughs> that fool say he just put too much weed. Sometimes it's just dope. <laughs> sometimes it's just, sometimes it's just oh, dope, man, Rob it's G. Funny. It's just it's just dope. I mean, and no judgment. I, and I've smoked in my lifetime. And sometimes I mean, you just smoke too much. You just smoke, sometimes you just smoke too much weed. Man. You just smoke. Too, I mean, sometimes we just need to be sober. You know what I mean? And Everybody was in here listening, like, what it is? <laughs> he smoked too much. <laughs> And, you know, and I think, man, if you don't really know yourself, mm. you know, you're going to make bad choices in relationships. And I've made a lot of bad choices, man. So is it better to wait later or? It depends. I know people got married in 1920. They got great marriages, man. I know people got married in their 40s and 50s and they miserable. It just really just depends, <laughs> yeah. you know. I just got lucky, man. And, and my wife, her name is Jenna, Jenna Parker. And she's just an amazing human being. And I feel blessed, man. You know what I mean. And well, we also kept it on the low. I didn't. I didn't announce that we was together until the day we got married. And all people was like, what? People, what? people were in Why? shock. Why? Because I wanted it to be private, man. And, right. You know, being out there in the public eyes, y'all been talking about people. I mean, y'all know people all up in your joint, man. And sometimes think about how Jay Z and Beyonce for years never really confirmed their relationship, and then they just got married. You know what I mean? Right. I was like, I said, well, we're gonna be like a low budget Jay Z and Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm That's how we gonna do it. You know what I mean? Shout out to Bay Houston H Town. You know what I'm saying? So. Well, good luck to you. Y'all have any kids yet? No, we want to do one. We want to do one and done. I mean, at my age, I can't he be chasing around a whole bunch of kids. <laughs> that's, that's why you got to keep on doing that yoga, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I want I want a daughter. I want her to be a sports-loving, hardcore. Why a daughter? Most men seem like they always want a, a, a little boy because they feel like Care somebody name. has to carry on the name. Well, she gonna she or he gonna have both our last names. We already agreed to that. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And, and no matter what, the, whatever the kids. How gonna you be. gonna tell your baby what your baby gonna have before <laughs> the baby get here? Well, we got it planned out. Me and my wife. And <laughs> you and sound I, like this dude over here. And I already said to my wife, the kid gonna be a sports. My wife ain't a sportsman, but I'm a diehard. It's like the kid gonna be watching sports all the time. Okay. You know what I'm saying so. And like I said. Uh, Shout out to, to uh, you know, uh, actually, you know what? I do want to shout out um, DeAndre Hopkins' mama, Sabrina Greenlee. She mm -hmm. and I have been talking. You know, I know y'all know her story, man. She um, She's yeah. a survivor of domestic violence. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, had a lot thrown in her face. She's blind, but she's a powerful woman. And shout out to the Texans and, and, and my man D. Hopkins, all pro. I want to say that publicly. And also, you know, um, shout out to Chris Paul. Hope he come back, man. You know, soon. I mean, <laughs> oh, Chris going to be all right. You know I mean? Chris going to be all right. And I, and, and I need your Astros to come on back, man, because oh. I was counting on y'all, man. Take them red socks <laughs> out. We there next year. Yeah, man. but H Town. You know what? The last time I was really in H Town for a significant amount of time was when um Hurricane Katrina happened yep. back in 05, 06. And you know, just much respect to Houston, man. Y'all been through a lot, and it's good to be in a city of champions. I just need to say that. You know yeah, what I mean? Well, thank you, Kevin. Much respect to y'all. Thank you, man. You know oh, I mean? thank you. We just started running, okay. and you talked about running a marathon. <laughs> yes, sir. So, how do you prepare for a marathon for us? Now, I can barely run three miles. And you start slow. You start there. I started like, um, you know, just you know the global warming. We've had storms all over the country. We had something called Superstorm Sandy. So you think Sandy. global warming mm -hmm. is real? I'm just asking. I do think it's real. We had a Superstorm Sandy in New York a few years back, and so we had like a, a benefit run. Man, I ran. It was like one mile. And I had little kids and old people run by me, man. And I was embarrassed. I was like, I can't. I'm like out of shape. It don't matter what your body type is. So I started short. I started small, half mile, then a mile. I, I had to get my confidence up. And then all of a sudden, I was like, I'm going to do a marathon, man. And I, I, did, I finished two New York City marathons. I couldn't believe I did it, you know. But I was like, if Diddy could train for six weeks, I trained for a whole year. I was like, I could do this. <laughs> <laughs> One question on the marathon, Kevin. Yes, sir. I know it's 26 miles. Yeah. What do you do when you gotta? You do you oh, have to use the restroom during that? I they mean, because it's like four. Oh, they do have breaks. Do okay. you stop? And some people pee on themselves. Honestly, that, people, that's what I've heard. So that's what I was like. Women, mm. men, people, all identities. People. Sometimes you just do what you gotta do. I mean, it's it's like the most. I have never done like anything like that in my life. Somewhere doing that thing, you're like, why am I doing this to myself? I must be out of my mind. But when you finish, it's like this, like you only 1% of the world's population actually runs marathons and finishes it. And I was like, man, I'm in that company. And that, it was, okay, say that again. 1% of the world's population actually runs. I think runs. I'm gonna do it. You should do it, you should do it. It's gonna be hard. But do it for a cause. I did it for St. Jude's twice since I raised oh, money St. for Jude's. kids who, yeah. are, who have cancer. So mm -hmm. I, I did it for something. I mean, y'all could do it. Do it for a cause. There's something that supports this, the city or this community. That's what I, like I say. That. I like yeah. that, I like that. And, and you I, say you trained a year. I trained a year each time. So you ran the whole thing, you didn't stop? I, well, what I- What was your time? I, I, 
it was Pause. slow. <laughs> but okay. I finished. But you finished. Okay. I finished. Right. I didn't finish last. I was like in the middle of the pack. Okay. Yeah. Like I could. I. I. Man. Like yeah. I did it, and I still love. I still run, and I skateboard. I was telling yeah. you, I have four skateboards, longboard. Shout out to the skateboarders in H Town. I love skateboarding. You know what I mean? What was that Lupe Fiasco song? Kick push. That's me. That's me, man. I just think that we should be active, man, any way we can. And I just, I just. Love. I think that's the most. Yeah. Important that's that's. And I love. I think most Americans are not. They yeah. don't Eat right. Yeah. And we don't do anything with any kind of uh, physical activity. To show you how much I've changed since the days of Tupac and um, um, MTV, I'm a vegan, I'm a yogi. Stuff. I mean, I, I was like, I ain't going to be one of them nuts and berries people. I'm one of those nuts and okay. berries people. Last question, I promise, Coop. If you yeah. are a vegan, yes, my little girl's vegan. Wow. How old is she? She's 16. I couldn't even I, imagine I was that. All, look, I was always showing her all that bad stuff on TV and yeah, what they do to yeah. the chicken. Because I was I was halfway vegan myself yeah. until we had that bad storm. And then I went back to my chicken. And chicken. <laughs> no disrespect, my brother. <laughs> no disrespect. When you out there trying to look for a meal, though, you got to make some concessions. I and I ain't going back. That's One day real. I'll be back there, but I, she's she's consistent. Wow. What's how do you find food? Because they don't have good places to find food when you when you vegan or vegetarian. And especially you travel a lot, right? So right. it's hard to so find. So it's hard for you, you know, to find food you quickly. When, yeah. What I do is I get on social media, IG, Facebook, whatever. I say, yo, Houston, yo, Dallas, where are the vegan places in your city? People hit me up. There's a place called Green Vegan here. Yeah, yeah. Green Seed. Like the, mm -hmm. green, what is it called? Green Seed. I'll be there at 11 a.m. today. <laughs> <laughs> so I go and find places. And then, like, if it's somewhere rural, I just, you know, I just got to go get some vegetables and some fruits. Man, it's hard on the road, you know what I mean? But it's like people know when I'm coming. Like, Kev, eat, is, I'm hardcore, too. I've been a vegan for about 12, 13 years. So how are you getting your proteins in and Beans, getting that balance? Beans, tofu, and all that? a lot of nuts, you know, mixture of stuff. I do a lot of protein drinks. Um, I'm mm. big on green juice and stuff like that. I'm like, I, I can't believe it. I grew up on McDonald's, Kentucky right, Fried right. Chicken, oh, right, right, soda, right, right, you know right, what I mean? Right, right. Pig's feet, all but then, of that. But then you learned that all that stuff is killing us. Yeah, and I, no judgment what I say to people. I don't judge people, Absolutely. but people ask me. I don't go on other people's social media pages, but they, they know on my page, you come to Kevin Powell in Brooklyn on Facebook or Instagram, I'm, I'm constantly posting stuff about health and wellness. That's what I, that's part of my activism now. Yeah, yeah. So that's what it is. You know what I mean? Kevin Powell, yeah. Thank Kevin, you. Thank, Thank you so man. much. Appreciate y'all. Ooh, man.